Lord is my shepherd. It's true. You believe it, don't you? I believe it. But is it real? I mean, is it, is it your lived experience that he's your shepherd? When they accuse you of something, do you sense that he is, he is really there? Not, not, not a doctrinal statement, not a truth that comes from the Bible, though, though I'd sign that any time. I'm, I'm all in on that, no, no doubt about it. But when you walk the streets of Patterson and the danger is there, is he, is he really there? I don't want to go on feelings all the time, but I, I want to feel it sometimes. I want to be assured that he's, he's really there. That when the day comes and I, I do go through that valley, and maybe in the weeks and the months approaching that valley, I know he's there. Not just because I signed that statement and say that I believe it, but, but because I know it. Do you know it? But he's there. I think it was a couple of years ago during the COVID lockdown that a church asked me to record a message on uh, Psalm 23, Psalm everybody knows. <laughs> I, I had never studied it before. I, I had never developed a message on it. I had just never done it. I'm not sure why that's the case, but I think it's because it's so, it's so obvious and everybody knows it so well. What, what can I say that's new about it? What, what can I say that'll be helpful to it? But I, man, as I began to look at the truth of Psalm 23, I began to capture some ideas that had been invading my life since 2002 and 2003 that had become reality to me that I guess I had forgotten about before, but I had forgotten about them. In the midst of a wonderful and a busy life in ministry, and it, it was wonderful, uh, people were coming to Millington in 2002 from all over the place, and some were coming, and you may be among them, from other churches that were going through hard times, and, and that's one way for a church to grow, but it was even more exciting that people were coming looking for answers to the real issues of life, and some of them were finding it in Jesus, and their lives were being transformed. They were being changed, and we were seeing that happen, so it was very, very exciting to be here at the time. And Liquid, the church that we would launch in 2002, was roaring down the, down the runway, even in 2002. In 2007, we launched. 2002, it was just roaring down the runway, and we had something by the tail. We didn't know how, what to do with it exactly, but we knew we'd better not stop it and keep it from going and taking flight. And naturally, I was busy. More people means more needs, more opportunities. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It was a joy for my life. My family was good. Everything was wonderful. I was traveling around the world to support missionaries and encourage them in a lot of different places around the world. I, I was stroked. I was uh, recognized as the leader of a church that was thriving. And I was out of breath. And I was pedaling harder and harder. And I was running faster and faster. I had failed to see it. The number one strategy of the enemy against those who are walking with Christ, who love him with all their hearts, who want to serve him, who are pushing other things aside so that they can keep the main thing the main thing, who, who want more than anything else to see other people come into life with Jesus, and who are succeeding in some sense in their ministry. They're seeing the fruit of their ministry, and they're rejoicing over that. Now, I'm assuming that some of you people would be like I was back then. These are good days. God's right in the middle of life, and he's transforming me, and he's changing me, and, and he's reaching other people through me, and, and I'm seeing things happen, and my kids are growing in the right direction, and my, my job is flourishing, and I'm, I'm making the money that I thought I should make a long time ago, and, and I'm finding joy in the midst of life, and we're going on vacations, and... And, and all kinds of good things are happening in the midst of life, and I'm experiencing his blessing. Now, Satan knows that. He, he knows what's going on in your life. He knows your commitment to walk with Christ, and he has a strategy to trip you up. Do you know what it is? In, in those good times. I mean, in the good times. Do, do you know what it is? It's likely not what you're thinking. It, it's likely not infidelity or lust, or materialism, or envy, or pride. I'd say those are secondary. I have become convinced that uh, the number one strategy of the enemy 
for those of us who are walking with Christ and seeing some good things happening, is self-sufficiency. Number one, it's self-sufficiency. Here's how it works. We start out the Christian life like I did in, two th or in 19, when did I start? 66. Boy, it's a long time ago, isn't it? June 8th, 1966. And uh, you start with a deep sense of gratitude. You know you are lost and God gets a hold of your life and he changes you and sees things happen and you have no desire except to serve him faithfully and effectively, naturally. So you work hard, you, you get extra training, you, you uh, study, you sharpen your gifts, you hone your skills, and then you do some more of that, and to some extent, you succeed, and you see the fruit from your efforts. And as that happens, you unconsciously begin to think that you are a really big part of the reason, why, and people will tell you who you are, so you begin to think that you are a part of the reason why that's happening. You are a key player. You are yes, God's at work through you, but, but you're really a part of it. And you don't think that out loud, and you don't, you don't want to say that out loud, but somewhere in the midst of it, you get to thinking that, yeah, boy, God is just, so I'm going to get more training. I I'm going for another degree. I I'm going to sharpen my skills, and I'm, I'm going to hone my, my efforts. I'm going, to, I'm going to give more time, and I'm going to do all the things that I know I need to do to have more of what I'm getting now because it is so good. It, it was really the unintended and unrecognized self-sufficiency that led to my mild to, to moderate depression in 2002 and would have led if uh, God had allowed it to, uh, to wreak havoc in my home and my ministry. But God, <laughs> yeah, but God. But God, in the midst of it, said, no, no, we're not going down that road. But God brought me to ideas like the ones I'm sharing with you today, and he rescued me. And Psalm 23 gives me a whole picture of that. So I want us to read it together, and I'd like to have a stand in respect for God's word. So let's stand together. It'll be on the screen, and we can read that together. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please, thank you. I see two parts to this psalm. Let me, let me start with the second part. It begins in the middle of verse 3. He guides me and might be called on the road because it's on the road. It's on the road to the dismal times. It's on the road to the good times. It's on the road to the hard times. It's on the road when they accuse you. It's on the, on the road when they don't trust you. It's on the road when you don't get that job or you don't keep that job. It's on the road when she walks out of the house or he does. It's on the road when the kids go the wrong direction as well as the good direction. It, it's on the road. So things that happen on the road. That's starting in the middle of verse 3. On the road. But I have become convinced that experiencing and living and knowing the reality of his presence on the road. Oh, he'll be there, no doubt about it. But my recognizing him there, my knowing that he's there, my experiencing that he's there, I have become convinced that that is largely dependent on the first part, and I call that at the rest stop, at the rest area. It's where you pull off the road on that long journey, and you're restored. And if you don't pull off and are restored, you know what happens on the journey. Not good, is it? Because you have to stop. So it's at the rest area, it's at the rest stop that we'll camp for this morning and consider what we need to do in order to finish the journey. Because I want to finish the journey. You too? Yeah, in faithfulness. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. In other words, he waits for us at the rest area, at the rest stop. 
But when you give yourself to someone, like I'm asking us to give ourselves to the Lord, you have to ask, who is he? And David, in writing the psalm, tells us who he is. Who is he? He is Yahweh. He is the Lord. That's who he is. I can't overstate the importance of that name, and you get some sense of the importance of the name when you look at most English Bible translations and you find that it's capitalized. And it's capitalized because the writers and the translators always want us to know that this is Yahweh. This is the Lord. You'll find that name in Genesis, but the place where it really becomes a hallmark for us is in the book of Exodus. It's in the book of Exodus that God calls Moses to go back into Egypt to set his people free, to bring them out into freedom, to Canaan land. And Moses is nervous. He, he doesn't know that he can do that. In fact, he knows he can't do that. He ran away once. He left Egypt. How can he go back in? How will they ever respect him? And so he says, who shall I say? Send me. So God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you, me to you. And that I am, that's the word Yahweh. That's the key word. And from that time on, the people of Israel would be known as the people of Yahweh. He is their covenant God. He is the one who's made this agreement with them that he will be their God. Yahweh, I am. Not just I was, not just I will be, but I, I am. I am timeless, eternal. He is the self-sufficient one, the cause for all creation. He is the covenant God of Israel. In fact, the name is so sacred that my friends across the street at the Kabad would not say it. They will substitute another name or another spelling for it or just skip over it because it is so sacred. That's who he is. The shepherd is Yahweh. Can you imagine? In fact, the two words don't even go in the same sentence in my mind. Yahweh? Shepherd? Yeah. Yahweh is so exalted. We bow before Yahweh. A shepherd in those days? Oh, not quite exalted. Forgotten. Pushed out into the fields. Not counted. You bow before Yahweh. Nobody bows before a shepherd. They have no rank whatsoever. They are dirty, unclean, of ill repute. But that's who he is. You talk about my shepherd. He's Yahweh. That's who he is. The second statement David says is, he is my shepherd. But that's not the way to say it. The way to say it is, he's my shepherd. You know, mine. Mine. There's ownership there. And when you think of that, and you begin to think about the creator, and you say, wait a minute, how can he be mine? He's the creator. How can the creator care about me? He notices me? He, he cares for me? L little me in my little corner of the world? God notices me? He's a shepherd to me? You must be joking. In my little moment of history that's going to pass away in a, in a breath and be gone? He cares? He notices me? Well, in the same way that Yahweh seems to be too exalted for the shepherd, uh, likewise, this uh, idea of him being my shepherd, that seems impossible. But David knew what a relief it was because of his failures. They were so public. He expected God to give up on him, but no, he said, no, Yahweh is my shepherd, my, my shepherd. And that means he knows my name. He knows the hairs on my head. He, he knows my potential. He knows my hopes, my dreams, my failures, my weaknesses. He knows my shame. My shepherd. I talked to a chaplain this uh, summer up at Camp of the Woods, and he was telling us, his retired chaplain in the Army, and he was telling us about a seminary professor who was a chaplain uh, at Normandy as the Allied troops invaded Europe for that uh, beginning of the end, I guess you could say it. Many would die after that, but it was the beginning of the end for the war in Europe. The chaplains decided that they wanted their troops to know uh, the shepherd. And uh, so they taught the troops to simply use their fingers for this purpose. You can do it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Try it. Everybody have five? If you have five, do it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. After the battles, thousands of troops on the beaches and in the water, large numbers of them they found died like this. My, my shepherd, as they breathe their last. That's what it means. He's mine. Not, not just in a statement in the Bible, though that's true. Not just in something I assent to and say, yeah, I believe that. No, 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 he's mine. He's mine. And then finally, when we look at who he is, we find that he is Jesus. And you say, wait a minute, how's that possible? This was written about a thousand years before Jesus ever existed upon the face of the earth. Jesus is the shepherd of Psalm 23. You've got to get through this. Well, he made that claim, and he made it both directly and indirectly. Look at the indirect statement, because he said he is the great I am. He is Yahweh, and he got in trouble for it. In John chapter 8, very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. There it is. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid, hid himself, stepping away, slipping away from the temple grounds. Why would they stone him? Well, the only reason they would stone him is because he said, I am. He said it in Greek, perhaps in Hebrew, but it's translated here in Greek. And they knew what he meant, regardless of the language that he used. He's claiming to be Yahweh, indirectly. He's claiming to be the shepherd. But, but then directly in John chapter 10, he says it very plainly. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And you probably know that the shepherd would lay down in the gateway of the sheep pen at night so that no one could come in and the sheep could not go out and be harmed. He would give his life for that. And when did Jesus lay down his life for us? You know that too, it's on the cross on the cross, talk about stepping down for the king of glory to step down to the cross is immense. But that's who he is. He's my shepherd. Christians from the beginning have placed high, high value on that cross. I have a friend who's a part of a church that doesn't have a cross at its center. I keep asking, what, where's the cross? He said, oh, no, that isn't as important as other things. I said, no, that is, that is important, the cross. The cross is there. It's got to be the cross we've got to see. Got to see the cross. From the first century, they were singing hymns about the cross. And Jesus taking his place on the cross. And Paul repeats one of those hymns in, in Philippians chapter 2. And at the end of that, he says in verse 8 of chapter 2, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even, and this is it, even death on the cross, even death on a cross of all things. And this is the one who came for me? Yeah, this is my shepherd laying down his life for me. As I studied Psalm 23, it struck me that Psalm 22 comes just before Psalm 23. And Psalm 22 might be called the Psalm of the Shepherd's Cross because it's that which Jesus repeats from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it goes on to speak about his bones out of joint and he's pierced and all kinds of things that could only mean the cross. And Jesus repeats it from the cross or at least a part of it. The Psalm of the Shepherd's Care comes after the Psalm of the Shepherd's Cross. And I would suggest to you that I cannot know the care of the shepherd until I know the cross of the shepherd. And the need is to be born again and become a part of his family. If you've not trusted him yet, then do it now. Because you can't fully experience the care of the shepherd until you've been to the cross of the shepherd where he laid down his life. So who is he? He is Yahweh. He is my shepherd. He is Jesus. And what does he promise? Well, you, you've seen it. What does he promise at the rest stop, at the, uh, the rest area? He promises green pastures and quiet waters. Let's look more closely for a few moments. Green pastures. Now, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand how essential that is for sheep. I mean, you run any animal too hard uh, without rest and food, and you'll see what happens to them. You can't do that. So, so the shepherd makes sure that the sheep get time to rest and eat from pastures that are rich and good. And if that's missing, then they'll be weak and skinny, and they'll be unable to be fruitful or weather the storms that are coming, and they'll die an early death. 
It's just the way it is if they don't stop. Get to the rest area. Have you been stopping at the rest area? They say life is hard. I know. I, I hear you. I get that. But to expect to walk through the valley of the shadow of death or the valley of indignation or the valley of accusation or the valley of poor health or the valley of lost loved ones or the valley of lost jobs or the valley of divorce court or the valley of not enough money, that's a journey you can't take with going to the re without going to the rest area. So the question is, have you been to the rest area frequently? regularly for the green pastures and the quiet waters where you can be nourished. And that's the second part of what he talks about. Quiet waters, the need for water is also easy to understand. I mean, you go for a, go for a hike on a hot, dusty trail, you know what it's like. Put your nose about two feet off the ground and you'll really know what it's like in the pack of a whole herd of other ones like you and the dust begins to overwhelm you and you can't go any further and you must have that water or you won't go any further. Let, let me ask you, when was the last time you went swimming with your heavy winter coat? I don't remember doing that. If you go swimming with your heavy winter coat, you'll go right to the bottom. If the sheep, except when they were shorn, if the sheep go into the water that is rushing and trips them up and they lose their footing and they go down, they'll stay down. Why? Because they have their heavy winter coat on. So he takes them to quiet waters because there they can drink from the waters and they can have what they need. Are you wearing the coat of self-sufficiency? That's what I was wearing. And I was doing well, and everybody thought I was really, really doing well. And I wanted them to think that, but I wasn't doing well, and I needed help. Because I was wearing a heavy coat of self-sufficiency. It has a way of dragging you into the waters of bad choices. Thank God I, I didn't, didn't do that. I was rescued in time. But you see men and women who are falling in disgrace from places of prominence and position. And I would, I would suspect that most of the time they haven't been to the quiet waters. They're swimming with heavy coats on. That heavy coat will carry you into waters like a heavy coat. That, 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 those bad choices, they carry you into waters like a heavy coat. It smothers you in shame. It makes you think the shepherd doesn't care. You've gone no, off in the wrong direction and there's, and there's no rest stop for you. Or busy living. You're doing all the right things, but there's no time for green pastures and quiet waters. There's lots of Bible studies. There's lots of Sunday worship. There's counseling. There's serving. That's wonderful. It's all good, but there's no rest. There's no quiet time with God. Or distracted living, one psychologist writes, this is where your attention is so torn in so many directions that you really don't focus on anything. And may I suggest that this thing may be at the root of much of it? Yeah. Distracted living. If, if there's anything missing from our lives today, and I speak from experience, not only my own, but those of other people with whom I have contact over these years, it is busy living, distracted. It's missing from us. So we take power naps and our phones buzz and chirp and we run faster to serve him and we speed read through the Bible and he's just waiting, wants to spend time with us. That's all he's looking for. Just give me some of your time. No wonder we're not prepared for what's to come. What's on the road, the difficulties that are a natural part of life, the enemy that attacks, the hard times at work, the valley of the shadow of death. We never get to the rest stop. Every runner knows not to run hard till the gun sounds. There has to be some rest. Every soldier knows not to train hard until the moment of battle. There has to be some rest. He has to be nourished. 
Long journeys on the road demand rest stops. They just do by nature. But self-sufficiency with its bad choices and its busyness and its distractions, we never get to the rest stop and we remain on what I, I like to call first level faith. Now, that may be a new term for you. It's not a Bible term, but, but it's just one that makes sense to me. Because God is calling us to second level faith. That, that's what he's calling you to. That's what he's calling me to. Let me explain if I can. First level faith starts with the new birth, and we are amazed as we experience the goodness of God in Christ. I mean, you're just blown away by it. But its focus, focus quickly turns to information and knowledge and obedience and duty, and we need all that. <laughs> but that's not enough. That's not enough. It's like getting on the road to California and never stopping at the rest stop. Or thinking that one or two stops will be enough. They won't be. They won't be. Consistently stopping at the rest stop, I'm finding, is bringing us to second level faith. And second level faith is an increasingly intimate relationship with Jesus. Where the knowledge of him, yes, yes, he is there and he will be there. But will I recognize him when I'm there? That's the question. Will I know that he's there? Will I experience that he's there? Or will it just be a factoid that I'll have to take by faith and force myself to believe and everybody will have to tell me and tell me and tell me and in my heart I still will wonder, is he really there? Or is he someplace else? This second level faith means a, an increasingly tender and soft relationship with God. It's the transformation that moves from the inside to the outside, not from the outside. And that's all I have, is from the inside. It's what we get at the rest stop, at the rest area. We get to know him. Whom to know is eternal life. Isn't that what it says? Whom, whom to know. Self-sufficiency will always fight against that. Always. And we won't even know it's there. But we want fullness, don't we? I mean, you want fullness, don't you? You want the abundance that Jesus talks about, don't you? I, I want that. I, I want that increasingly more than ever. The older I get, the more I want it. I want fullness. So let's think about a path to second level faith. It's just a path. It's not three easy steps. I used to talk about three easy steps. They don't work. <laughs> it ain't true. <laughs> the Christian life and growing in Christ is a pathway. It's not three easy. I get to this and I get to this and I get that. Got it. No, no, don't got it. As soon as I think I got it, I don't got it. You know? Yeah. So let me just talk about a pathway if I can. And the first one may be obvious. It's taking time to be with him. That's all. Just be with him. Time at the rest stop, the rest area. I came across a scripture that I'd read, I'm sure, a lot of times before, but I came across it, I don't know, in this journey in the last 20 years that just grabbed my heart in such a way that I said, this is it. It is taking time to be with him. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 14. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Which one is the journey? Well, it's the second part, isn't it? But how do they get ready to go on the journey, on the long journey? The first part. And what's the first part? It's being with him. That's all. It's just, it's just so simple. It's being with him at the rest stop and then going on the road. And go back to the rest stop and get back on the road. And go back to the rest stop and go back to the road. In fact, you see the fruit of that in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been, what? With Jesus. <laughs> That's the transformation that takes it so that I'm ready for the road. I'm ready for the journey because I've been to the rest stop. I've been with Jesus. I don't, know where I, I don't know where I lost that. I just don't know in my busyness. Where'd you lose it? Maybe you haven't. Thank God. But if you had, we've got to get back there. Like Jesus came, spent time with his father, so the disciples spent time with him. And so that he was ready for the long journey that was ahead of him that went all the way to the cross. So his disciples were ready for whatever came their way. 
And when people looked at them and said, why, why are they sticking with this so much? Well, they concluded, why? Because they were with Jesus, that's why. That's why. Like Mary, they pondered in their hearts these things that were true. That's why. They were with Jesus. One of the most refreshing things that's happened in my life in the last, I guess it's four years now, is The Chosen. Now, I know, not everybody likes The Chosen. I get that. And I, you have to look at The Chosen not like a one-episode thing. It's a character development. But I tell you what, watching The Chosen has given me a new, new picture of what it's like to be with Jesus. I mean, those guys were just around the campfire, and they watched him. And then he said something, they listened to him. And then they asked him something. And they walked with him. Their speed was the speed of walking. Yeah, that's hard, isn't it? Who wants to walk? I want my motorcycle back. <laughs> I watched them and I thought, this is it. Now here's the bad news. If you want to be with Jesus, you'll start getting control of your calendar and your time and our phones and our commitments. And somehow during most days, he will get some undivided attention. You ever have people sit with you, maybe having coffee, and you're having a conversation, and their phone bings, and they start writing out a text, and you're talking to them, and they're like this. And... <laughs> Most of the time, I want to say, let's talk later, maybe another day. Put it down. Undistracted attention. That's what he's looking for. And isn't that really what he deserves? Doesn't he deserve my undivided attention? If he's waiting at the green pastures and the quiet waters, doesn't he deserve that? And, and don't I need that? So carve it out. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be brutal, but carve it out. I, I don't know what your calendar looks like, but carve it out. If you have to get up in the middle of the night and spend five minutes with Jesus, and get up in the middle of the night and spend five minutes with Jesus, and if it can be 10 minutes good, if it can be 30 minutes better, Early in the morning, late at night, I, I, don't, I don't really care. He's waiting for you at the rest stop, at the rest area in your long journey. The other piece of advice I give you about this path, and I'm learning about it, is be intentional. You're there to be with him. You're not there to ask for something. You're not, you don't have one request after another. You don't have a long list of, oh, Jesus, would you do this for me and this for me? And, and it's not even, would you do this for her and him and them and in her. No, it's just to be with him. That's a, there's nothing else. It's just to be with him. This is not a checklist. It's not a discipline. It's not a responsibility. It's not a duty. I've done all that. A couple of years ago, I started reading my Bible through again uh, in a year kind of thing. This time I'm doing it with a chronological Bible and I'm really loving it. But, but when I began to do that, I got nervous because in the past when I read my Bible through in a year, it became a duty. And if I didn't keep up with that stupid list of when I was supposed to read this and this, you know what I'm talking about. It became a duty and a responsibility. And I lost all sight of Jesus being there with me because I was doing what I was supposed to do. So now when I open my Bible, I, I say this repeatedly. When I open it, I say it repeatedly again and again. I say, Jesus, I set aside this time to be with you because I want to know you. That's all. If that's all I get, that's all I want. I don't, I don't care. I could pray about you or you or you some other time. I just want to be with him. I just want to know him. And I get that from the Apostle Paul. And he said, I want to know Christ. I want, I want to know him. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So as you listen to a sermon, be saying, Jesus, I really want to know you. As you're going to a Bible study, be, be saying, Lord, I just want to sit and watch you and soak up what you are and have. As you see the beauty of creation, say, oh, you're the great creator. I want to know you as I look at the wonder of creation. I, I, I just... I want to know you, Lord. So I ask you, would you commit to take whatever step is needed to be with the shepherd on a regular basis? For, for whatever time. 
So just so you get to those green pastures and those quiet waters, would you say, Jesus, I'm going to be there at a regular time. And this is what I'm going to start out with. That you might be with him, that you might know him. And, and would you identify in your mind, maybe even write it down, would you identify in your mind the first step that you can make to make that a reality today or tomorrow? Don't put this off because it gets lost someplace in your list of to-dos. Oh, yeah, Peter said something about that back last... No, that was three weeks ago. Let's see now. I've got to do something about that. No, no. What's the first step you can take that you can make sure that you're there with him on a regular basis? At the rest area. At the rest area. Let's pray together. Soak that in. Hard for us to imagine that you want to be at the rest area with us, Lord. Oh, golly. The way we've lived, the way we've thought, the way we've treated people, the way we haven't treated other people, but you, you still want to be there with us. And as we see things clearly, and as we see things right, Lord, we want to be there with you. Because we know that knowing you is the essence of life. It is the critical chapter of life. It is, the, it is what will lead us to the fullness that we all want. So, Father God, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts right now. We might not put this off for another time or a better time, because now's the time. Now's the time, Lord, speak to our hearts. Teach us what that step of commitment means, how to define it, when to do it, and then to give it up to you, that we might know you, for we pray in our shepherd's name. Amen.